I will call the meeting of the Select Board to order at 7 p.m. on Monday, March 15th, 2021. I will run the meeting until we get through Select Board Organization Item A, and then the chair can take over from that point. Um, first thing we want to do is to welcome Danny as our newest Select Board member, Danny Tallman. Congratulations on your election. Thank you. And congrats to Mark and Katie for your re-election. Um, and thanks to all of you, really, for serving the residents of Waterbury. Um, so the first order of business is to approve the agenda. I would like to add a liquor license for the reservoir. And I would like to move the consent agenda item C, which is the newspaper record, consider the newspaper record and alternate to uh, select board business item B, because I think it will take like a minute or two of conversation. Does anybody else have anything? I, I was thinking maybe we might want to add the discussion on that river road. Um, is it river road? The Little, Little River? Yeah. Maybe just under C for select board business. Okay. Anything else? Okay, I entertain a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Moved. Second. Who moved it? Chris. Any other discussion? All those in favor of approving the agenda as amended, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? All right. Next order of business is to elect a select board chair for the ensuing year. I will entertain nominations for select board chair. Nominate Mike Mark Pryor. I second that. Sorry, I'm taking up at the same time. Do I hear any further nominations for select board chair? All right, all those in favor of Mark Fryer serving as select board chair for the ensuing year? Be before, we vo before we vote, I just want to make sure that Mark's comfortable with being the chair. Can hear him decline. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to be the chair for the ensuing year. Right. Thank you for the nominations. Just all wanted to make favor. sure. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, I'll entertain nominations for vice chair for the ensuing year. I nominate uh, Chris Fiennes as vice chair. Second that. Do I hear any further nominations? Chris, are you willing to serve as vice chair? Yeah, I'm totally willing to, as long as you people are happy having me. All right. All those in favor of Chris Vien serving as vice chair for the ensuing year, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? And finally, I'll entertain nominations for secretary of the board, and I'll also let you know that that means you really don't have to do anything. <laughs> Mike, you're always good at that kind of stuff. I I always could take minutes. If you oh, want to wow. nominate me, I'll, you know, I, I didn't have to do anything last year in this, as secretary, but I'd be glad to do it if if if, 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 if Bill or, or Carla are not there or we Karen. Like get by a bus and nobody can do minutes, right? <laughs> uh, do I have a second for that? Second. Do I hear any other nominations? All right, all those in favor of Mike Bard serving as select board chair for the ensuing year, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Mark, take it away. Thank you very much. 
Um, we will move to consider a conflict of interest policy, which was emailed out with the agenda. And I am bringing it up right now. So has anything changed from the previous year? Sorry, my email. No. I'm going to bring it back up. No. Both of the both the conflict of interest policy and the rules of procedure are the same as they have been in previous years. Did everyone have a chance to take a look at the conflict of interest policy? Okay. I have a question about the conflict of interest policy. Um, I'm curious since we're since we're reapproving um, if we could consider gender neutral language. It refers to select board members as him or her, his or her, and I wonder if we could simply switch that to them or themselves. It's an easy switch and could be more inclusive going forward for future select board members. Danny, could you clarify what you mean by that? Just sure. Yeah. So should a should someone um, be elected to select board who identifies as non-binary, doesn't identify with a male or female gender, generally the accepted term is they them, um, and so we could eliminate the gendered language in the um, policy where it says like uh, I'm scrolling now. It's like, like the, you know, his her spouse would be their spouse, right? Or recuse him or herself. Instead of two words, we can simplify it to one and say recuse themselves. It's accepted, you know, as a singular um, pronoun now. I can certainly make that change if, uh, if that's what you all approve. Yeah, I'm supportive of the change. I just, um, there's quite a bit probably in here that would need to be modified. So I wondered if we want to adopt this tonight and then do the modifications and readopt the new policy is that possible yeah that's probably the better thing to do it i don't have it in front of me but if you think there's quite a few uh things to change just to make sure we get it all if you adopt this tonight and then for your next meeting carla can get it yeah. uh, re rewritten yeah because danny we would have to state every single change in the motion otherwise i think um, or catch them all right now and make sure those changes are so um, yeah if, if Carla thinks that she can make those changes we could approve this tonight and then uh, approve the modified one in the following meeting I can, the I, motion. Can, Go ahead. I can make changes and maybe run it by you Danny should the motion say that with the intent to change or no um I don't think so. I have in my minutes that Danny made that suggestion and that the policy will be readopted once the language has been changed. So I think you can just approve it the way it is for yeah. now. Can, can um, we just defer that decision until next time where and make the modifications and just act on it then? I think we need a policy in place before we start even today's meeting. Okay. I move to adopt the policy of, of conflict of interest as currently written. All right, is there a second? Second. All right, any further discussion? And again, we know that we're gonna be voting on this again, but um, we'll move forward with this tonight. Um, any further discussion? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, next up is the rules of procedure. And I need to bring that up. Um, Danny, is this, I, I need to bring it up again. Um, similar, Are there, is it in rules of procedure as well? Okay. Um, you know, I didn't make a note of it, so I'm, it might not be, but I'm happy to look it over. And then if need be, I could email you, Carla, if that works okay. I didn't make a note of it, so it might not be. Okay. 
Um, anybody have any comments or questions on the rules of procedure? I don't, my quick scan, I do not see that language in here, so. I don't either. Uh, I do have a question. Um, so it says for public comment, um, procedures uh, in number nine, <laughs> Rules should be made available at all meetings and procedures for public comment shall be reviewed at the beginning of all meetings. But as a member of the public, I don't believe I've ever heard those reviewed at the beginning of a meeting. So I'm curious about that. And I'd love some clarification about that number nine rule. I don't have it in front of me. Um, I can read it, Bill. So, Bill, it says these rules shall be made available at all meetings um, and procedures for public comment shall be reviewed at the beginning of all meetings. Yeah. So, so, I don't believe we've ever not um, made rules available, but we typically are not telling public comment procedures at the beginning of each meeting. Right. Um, and, you know, I, again, I don't have it right in front of me, but I guess a literal meaning would be that the chair should tell the public at the beginning of the meeting that we have five minutes uh, for public comment. You can make a comment now. There's always a public uh, agenda item on there. And I think the board has been pretty liberal, has not, if anything, has allowed the public mm -hmm. to have a longer period of time than the rule generally calls for. So it's something that you know, we probably should look at, have available. Uh, it's really a tool to help the board manage the, the, the meeting because um, these are select board meetings. They're not, they're not town meetings. They're, the meetings are designed for the select board to conduct business that it has to co uh, um, conduct. Uh, the public is certainly allowed at the beginning of the meeting generally to bring any issue up that they want to bring up and typically if the public brings something up and it has to be um, addressed usually it's set aside for being addressed at a later meeting it's just the, the ability to let the public have a, a say uh, the board is pretty liberal about letting the public kind of chime in when there's a discussion going on uh, uh, some towns don't allow that at all. I just say, you know, the public had their time at the beginning of the meeting to address an issue. And then from then on, it's the select board's meeting. So. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thanks, Bill. I, I should clarify. Um, my question isn't about the time allotted or the actual rules for public comment. Um, my question is that we have a rule that states that the procedure for public comment should be, um, what's the word, reviewed? Uh, at every meeting. So either um, we we think about is that a rule that we want to have in place and then we, we, we follow that procedure or do we want to review that procedure if that's not something we think should be done at the beginning of every meeting. Is that more clear? Yeah, I apologize. That, that's up to the board. That, it's a board policy and the board can, it's the, the select board needs to make that decision. I, I'm wondering if that rule is not necessarily, maybe it's being read as we should be talking about it, but you know, we've had meetings where we knew there was going to be quite a bit of public participation. And so, um, you know, there's been discussions between myself, Bill, and I'm sure there's been other conversations and other meetings, but uh, when we know that we're going to have a lot of public comment, we, we do um, come into the meeting and, and set some groundwork for public comment. I feel like that's what that's referring to, but maybe I, I'm reading it, but, um, you know, I don't know if it necessarily, uh, we haven't typically talked at the beginning of the meeting and, and I understand what you're saying. Um, you know, we do try to give everyone an opportunity to talk during public comment without necessarily limitation if, if possible. Um, and we do, uh, we do encourage and participation in the meetings. So I think it's important that, you know, uh, at least 
uh, the, the previous boards, we've, we've made sure that the public can chime in on certain topics, um, especially if there's time. Um, right, so I, again, I don't think it's, I don't think the problem is you don't allow ample time. I certainly believe that you do, but this says all meetings. And so if we want it to apply to some, then we could change the wording to say, can be reviewed at the beginning of meetings, which gives that choice, but saying sh shall be reviewed at the beginning of all meetings to me, the words matter. So if it says all, then we're not doing yeah, I, Like, I don't mean to harp on it. I just, it's I like. Don't, I don't think it's, in my opinion, this is the, this is how we as a board approach the meeting. So if we, you know, if we go into tonight's meeting, we felt like public comment was going to be heavy that maybe we put limitations in it. But I think it's, there's a thought in every meeting, but if we don't think there's going to be something that's going to bring a lot of public out and there's going to be comment, I think that's, to me, that's, I don't think it's necessarily saying that we're going to talk about how we're going to deal with public comment in every meeting. Um, and maybe I'm reading that differently, but that's how I interpret it. Um, Chris, I see you have your, your hand up. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, it's always been my uh, thought that people are allowed to bring forward any any issue during public comment that they uh, are concerned about. Uh, and we kind of monitor uh, how that conversation goes. If they start to become really redundant and, uh, you know, just keep beating the same horse to death, then we typically step in and say, you know, we have to, we have to allow for other people to speak or, you know, we get your point um, type of thing. But it, it's, it's always been my belief, and I can't speak for the rest of the board, that when it comes to any issue, uh, I'm all ears open uh, for as much information about any particular topic that I can gather in order to make uh, best best decision on any given topic that I can. So. I think we're all missing. I think we're all missing Danny's point. <laughs> the, the rule, the rule says that you're supposed to read the public procedure at the beginning of every meeting. So I think if you take her suggestion and say, change the word "shall" to "may," and then if we don't read it, we haven't violated the rules. It's the procedure that she's asking about, and and we clearly don't do that. Right. So it's probably not a good idea that the. The policy says shall if it says that. So I think we can make this simple, change that. I, again, I don't have it in front of me. If we need to wait until the next meeting to readopt this, we can look at the language again. But uh, I think her point is that it's just about reading the rule and reading the procedures. And we don't do that. And there's no need to do that at every meeting. The only reason we might want to do it is um, I attended probably six months of meetings before I approached Mark to ask this clarification. I thought after public comment, I wasn't allowed to make any comments. And so I had went to Mark separately and said, am I allowed to make a comment during a meeting? Cause I didn't know I was allowed as a member of the public. So it could be helpful. Maybe we don't need to say it. It could go in the chat or maybe we just make sure, I don't know that people know it. Um, but, uh, but just as a, as a member of the public, I didn't know the procedure. It had never been told to me. Um, so it might be worth seeing very briefly at the beginning of every meeting. Um, and I don't I think know if it would be a good opportunity to say something at the public comment. And say, here's your opportunity for public comment. If you're here to talk about a specific item, you're also allowed to you know, speak during those items. I think that would be a, a you know, because I agree, there are people that come in that haven't attended a select board meeting ever or in years and might not realize that. So um, that would be fine. If we want to make that change and somebody wants to make a motion to approve with the change from shall to may. Um, I, Mark? I, I, yep. Dana has his hand up. Dana Allen. Dana, go ahead. Hey, I'll be brief. Um, I was just going to echo, uh, you know, the feeling of confusion as to how you get recognized as a member of the public. I think it's super useful to have that preface at the beginning of meetings. Um, and Bill, you and I have exchanged emails about, you know, the future of select board meetings going forward, where there may be a hybrid sort of system on some level, um, you know, and I think that as an in-person and an online component, um, having a, a clear procedure for the public would be really helpful because 
I'm ignorant of how these things should or can go. Um, and so just having rules on the ground clearly stated at the beginning, I think makes a ton of sense. So that's all I've got. Thank you for considering it. Yep, thanks. Thanks, Dan. So yeah, I think you, can, you can adopt this one tonight just to move yep. on. And then between now and the next meeting, Carol and I can look at this and maybe we can suggest some different language. Zoom's changed this a lot too, because before there was a microphone plugged in and you would just queue up if, yeah, and you knew someone from the public was looking to speak. It's a little harder now to to make sure. So thank you, Dana, for that those comments. And um, yeah, if there's no other discussion, I think we can probably make a motion tonight on this and um, review it. And if there's any other changes, we can we can talk about them. Anyone want to make a motion or? If Carla has the words right, and I can just say so moved, then I'll say that. It's just all, all it is is adopting this with a change in item nine from the word shall to may, I think would be the okay. most. I'll second it then if Katie in the motion. Okay, uh, moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, Discuss process for signing warrants. Carly, you want me to take this or you want to talk about it? You can take it, Bill. Okay. Um, so this could have been under orientation for board members as well. And like everything, Zoom has changed this a little bit. And Carly, if I, uh, I'll get a little bit lost, you might have to fill in the blanks. Um, State law provides that um, Carla is the treasurer and uh, a bookkeeper for the town works, works directly for me. And we process bills for payment every week. We pay our vendors every week. We, we do payroll every week. Uh, Carla is the treasurer and has the ability to write checks on the town's checking account. But the law does state that the treasurer may not draw a check on the checking account unless the select board signs uh, what are called warrant orders. So every week there are there are orders that get generated that go along with the bills. So for you know paying uh, you know pipe industries for pavement, or if we're paying um, you know borns for heating fuel. A check gets cut, but there's also a register that lists who the vendor is and how much the payment is for. And before those checks can be released, a select board member has to sign those warrant orders. It used to be that they had to be signed at a meeting and the majority of the board had to approve the orders and then sign them. The legislature changed that law about 10 years ago now, and the select board at this organization meeting, if they choose to, can make a motion to designate one or all board members to sign orders. And we as staff have asked the select board to make a motion to approve uh, each and every one select board member to be able to sign orders. Only one signature is required now if that order, if that motion is passed. <clears throat> And before COVID, you know, we'd have the orders ready uh, the night of the meeting and, and somebody could sign them on, on the meeting night. And on the weeks that we didn't have meetings, somebody would come in on, <clears throat> say, Tuesday morning and sign the orders. Now, with COVID, uh, Carla is going to have to step in and tell me what happens. We send an email, Carla, I think, but we take it from there. Yeah, so what we do right now is um, scan the warrants. I mean, in a perfect world, the board member should be looking at the warrants as uh, compared to the checks that have been cut. I review the checks against the warrants. Um, so since COVID, we scan the warrants to the board members, and I just ask one of the board members to review them, sign them, and scan them back. So when you do it in person, typically you'd have the bill, you'd have the warrant order, and you'd have the check, and you'd be able to compare all three. Um, we do double check and, and check here. So an, a motion is in order to authorize uh, 
each and every select board member to sign the warrant order is requiring only one to allow the checks to be written. So if somebody will make that motion and pass that, that's that's the big request for right now. You're muted, Mike. I've noticed. Uh, I make a motion to um, to approve that the warrants be signed uh, electronically by one select board member in in lieu of a in lieu of being able to do it personally. But every select board member is authorized, right? Right. That way, it's not just one. Any one of you can sign it, and it's. It, I mean. It's, all, it's not just electronically because someday we'll go back into in person. So it's just one, uh, you don't have to put the word electronically until. Okay. Second. <clears throat> all right, it's been moved and seconded. Carla, how's the motion? <laughs> all right, um, any further discussion? Uh, just one statement, that's, that's why I haven't signed warrants. Part of the reason uh, is because I want, I, I, maybe I'm stubborn, but I, until I can go back to the office and sit down and look at those things in their entirety, I just don't feel comfortable signing them. I mean, I know we've got a almost flawless process, but I just rather, for me, I'd rather be sitting right there looking at all the paperwork. I mean, alternatively, Mondays, I don't have any appointments, so somebody could make an appointment to come in and review them. I don't know how comfortable you are with that. Totally. We just passed this motion, then yes, it's been ma getting signed, so we can deal with it. And if Chris wants to come in and look at them, he can do that. But. Okay, that's all I got, Mark. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Yeah, Chris, I, I can probably help. I'd rather do that as well, so um, maybe we can split some Mondays. Just just as a comment, I know I probably do, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the approvals electronically. I know it's probably because a lot of you are away from the ability to sign something and then scan it and stuff like that. I look at things and if I look, see anything that just seems out of whack, you know, I'll usually email Carla and just ask about something and Granted, I don't look at everything. I guess I'm one as as a former manager. I try to trust people and their abilities, and I I I have trust in both Bill and Carla's uh, ability to have pay our vendors. Well, we appreciate that, and your trust is uh, we're thankful for it. Uh, we do make mistakes from time to time. There are that's there are why I look. There are times that we've made a mistake, and uh, there's been times boards have caught it. But anyway, uh, we hope you can pass this motion. Yep, I think it's been passed already. Okay. Yep. Okay, uh, we'll move on to consent agenda items. And remember, item C has been removed. So it's minutes for March 1st meeting, and then the liquor licenses for cold Hollow Cider Mill, Jim's Pizza, Crossroads Beverage, Outside Consumption for Best Western Plus, and the Reservoir. Um, I am going to recuse myself on this. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? A second. All, right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, uh, moving on to general public. This is an opportunity for the public to speak on any items that are not in the agenda. Um, you are allowed to speak through the remainder of the meeting on other items. Um, and there is a raise your hand button on Zoom. So you can use that and we'll try to get to you. If for some reason we don't get to you, uh, feel free to throw some something in the chat window. Um, so is there any public that would like to speak tonight? Uh, Glenn Anderson, I see your hand is up. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to check in and see if I didn't miss the, you guys didn't cover the the topic uh, up this way, did you yet? Uh, which one what is that? Topic is up I about. saw on the agenda, um, actually Debbie brought it to my attention, uh, something about the Anderson Grayson appeal. No, we haven't talked about that yet. And it's 
going to be very brief. It's not going to be a real discussion, Glenn. It's just going to be me giving a little information to the board. Okay. Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to sit back. I just want to make sure I didn't miss that. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, guys. It's, uh, it's uh, the last item on manager's items, which um, is estimated around an 8 o'clock start time. Yeah, I will keep myself muted, and I might drift in and out, but um, I definitely appreciate what you guys are doing, and so I'll probably just follow along and see what's the – Okay. Uh, initiation process is like so all right thanks guys thanks Glenn. um any other public comment before we move on to select board business all right i don't see or hear anyone so we'll move on um select board business discuss ice center and senior center so bill were you the one for the senior center and if so do you want me to go first I, I didn't put either one of these on there. I think you asked for it, Katie. Oh, okay. Well, I think I just put on, oh, okay. Um, anyway, so I've sent all of you the joint minutes that Nick and I have um, made together for all the ICE Center Board of Directors meetings. Um, and I was just wondering if you all had a chance to browse through those and if you had any questions at this time, or if you had any questions you would like me to bring to the ICE Center board on behalf of the town. I see they have two representatives on the call right now, but I would still like to bring them before their entire board. And um, that's all. No questions, Katie. It was a good set of notes. Yeah, I, I was wondering, um, I didn't really see, I mean, I, and we don't have to talk about it tonight, but I know it seemed like financially there was concern of losing the, you know, peak of their typical business. Um, how concerning is that ongoing and the ability to make their bills, I guess? So I'm going to jump in here for a second, if it's okay, um, partly for uh, Danny's edification. Uh, and then anybody else as well. Uh, the ICE Center is a not-for-profit private organization. Uh, it, it does not receive any funding from the municipality, from either uh, the town or, um, or EFUD. It's, uh, it's tax exempt, it pays, it pays no taxes. That is by um, uh, law that the legislature passed probably about five years ago now. Uh, so uh, it's a not-for-profit organization. Uh, unlike the Senior Center and other not-for-profits, uh, they have not asked the municipality for any money. Um, they have borrowed money from EFUD, from the former Village of Watery. They have a UDAG loan outstanding. It's uh, a little bit north of a half a million dollars. Um, uh, EFUD is the largest lender into the ICE Center right now. They have another loan with Community National Bank in the $350,000 range, I think. Um, EFUD has uh, lent some money the last couple of years to allow them to uh, pay off some of their uh, bank loans. They have a more favorable interest rate with EFUD. Um, the money is not tax money from the from the uh, Edward Farai Utility District. It's from their UDAG fund. It can't be used for um, for general government um, operations. So it's money that is lent out to area businesses. So um, when the pandemic struck a year ago, um, I recommended to the FUD board that all of the um, principal and interest payments that all of the borrowers from uh, the UDAG fund be suspended. And the interest rates were cut to zero uh, because, you know, you can tell somebody you don't have to pay us, but as, if you keep the interest rate going and some of these loans uh, that EFUD had were, you know, in the four and a half to 5% range, the, the ICE Center loans were less than that on a percentage basis. But uh, if you suspend payments, 
but you keep the interest meter running, it just kind of piles up on them and it doesn't really do them any favors. So EFUD suspended uh, principal and interest payments and cut the interest rate to zero. They did that initially from uh, March last year, right around this time until July. In July, they extended it out until the end of the year. Um, and then uh, just before December, they suspended it out through April. And then just last week, and I haven't even shared this with any of the borrowers yet, the EFUD commissioners uh, agreed to continue the suspension of payments and the 0% interest through the rest of this year. So it gets them all into 2022 before they have to resume payments. And the idea behind that is these businesses like the ICE Center, like some of the restaurants who are borrowers from the EFUD uh, fund, um, you know, they've been open, maybe uh, the ICE Center has been under severe restrictions in terms of who they can rent ice to, how much ice that they're able to have, restaurants have seating limitations. So we'll be informing all the borrowers from the UDAG fund that, you know, just concentrate on your business for the rest of the year when the governor lets you reopen to a greater degree or even go back to normal. You can have several months, we hope, of just kind of getting your cash flow back the way it's supposed to be. And uh, we'll, we'll turn these loans on next year. So um, the, there's, there's no uh, municipal commitment to these to, to the ICE Center except for this loan. And um, I guess that's all I need to say for right now. If you have any other questions, the board members certainly can, can ask me. Uh, I see Jonathan Siegel from the ICE Center is on and Mike Thompson is on. I don't know if anybody else is here, but you're here to answer questions. Um, Katie, I know just from the meeting that they had on, on Friday, uh, you, you sent out your report to uh, me and the select board reporting on what happened on Friday night. I think the, the folks at the ICE Center would prefer if you would at least share those notes with them to make sure there's no errors in it. I think there was an error that I heard about today from uh, Tim, who's the manager at the rink in terms of one of the things that you attributed to him. So uh, maybe you should share the minutes with the folks at the ICE Center before you send them out to everybody else, just so they can make sure that you got it right. Usually I do CC everybody on that. I think that I just forgot last time, but I can share that with them or Timmy too. I know yeah. Jonathan's email has an issue and it always bounces back. So, um, but other than that, I send it usually to everybody, including okay. Carla too. All right. It might be helpful if you just send it to the ICE Center board first before you send it to me and the select board, just because if there's a, a concern or an error, it's a lot easier to fix it before everybody reads it as opposed to after. John or Mike, you have anything else to add? Uh, well, I, I agree with that comment about it would be good if we could go over it with you first. Um, <clears throat> because once it goes out, if there's anything incorrect in there, it's tough uninforming people. I don't know what happens to these notes once they go out. But um, in a formal meeting like you're having right now, I mean, the minutes are approved at the following meeting and then they go out after that. It's approved minutes that go out. It's not the draft. Um, well, for, for minutes like select board meetings, the minutes have to be published within three days of the meeting. Uh, they can be corrected. The select board does approve them, but just so everybody knows, the meeting of the, of the select board or any public body actually have to be posted pretty quickly. And then if there's a correction, they're done at the next meeting. But uh, the ICE Center is not a public body, so there's no reason why these reports can't be shared with the board first to make sure it's right. I think the idea is, you know, having Katie and Lefty from the, Lefty Sayer from EFUD and Nick um, Nato is, is kind of my liaison to the ICE Center board. The idea of this was to 
open the lines of communication and make sure that everybody was understanding what was going on. It's a difficult time for a lot of businesses, including the ICE Center. And they, they asked for a representative from the select board and Katie, you know, volunteered quickly for it. I'm glad that she's going and I think it can be very helpful. <coughs> but the idea is to communicate well, uh, not just quickly. So just if we can just make sure everybody's satisfied that we got it right before we widely disseminated, I think it's helpful. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got to get some water. You guys can talk. <clears throat> okay. Um, yes, I, I don't really have anything else to add unless anyone else wants to comment. Um, and obviously with some new, with at least um, Danny coming on the board, um, you know, maybe the representatives from the ICE Center could just talk about what their hopes are for you know, ongoing from the select board and, and how we can help in any way. I know that financially we don't necessarily have direct ties, but, um, you know, we're happy to help if and where we can. Well, um, we don't really, we're not asking for anything from the select board. We were just hoping the point of the liaison, um, Bill and I were talking last summer about this and, uh, we both agreed that it would be good considering we are a presence in the, town, the village, that um, we have a little closer relationship with you guys. Again, not to ask for anything, but just so that everybody knows what's going on. And uh, it's a trying time right now. We're open with limited ice, as Bill mentioned. Uh, when the schools get done the end of this month, the youth groups, and we're hopeful that the governor will allow us to start um, hosting adult games. Right. But at the moment, all that's happening is kids and school hockey. Right. Um, no public adult games. games. Sorry, John. Uh, adult games um, represent approximately 20 to 25% of our total revenue. And a lot of it is because it's year round. Right. <clears throat> and part of the, um, that's based on what was before the pandemic. I mean, when we come back, there's going to be, you know, a lot of restrictions. We're still not allowed to use locker rooms. And I'm guessing there'll be some adult players who did play regularly who may not be all that excited about coming back quite yet. So we're not expecting that all of a sudden this is going to be full speed, you know, at the end of the month. And summer is typically our slow season. So we're kind of going into our slow season with, you know, both hands tied behind our back here. So it's not a great time, but the EFUD has been very generous with their, yeah. um, uh, financing terms for us, giving us a pass for the year, and hopefully we'll get through this and get back to some kind of normal at some point. But um, yeah. it's about all that's going on. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I just want to um, let you guys know that uh, I think the, the board along with the municipality, are, they're always concerned when you have private businesses in communities that to make sure that they can stay on financially stable ground. Um, I think it's good. I read through the minutes that are sent out by Katie uh, every time she sends them out just to kind of get my own gut feeling. And, you know, if I'm not stepping over the line here, I'll ask you guys, is your, is your outlook for your financial future are you optimistic that, that you're going to be able to keep this thing, uh, you know, uh, on the up and up? Um, I know there's a fair amount of federal dollars out there. I don't know if that's helping you at all, if you're able to apply for any of those. Um, I just, we just had an email that was sent to us the other day. I didn't read through the specifics, but I did see that, there, that each town uh, in the state is going to be allotted a certain portion of money uh, I don't know if you'd be eligible for any of that. I didn't read through the real criteria of it all. And I, I wasn't so sure that the criteria was there to be able to understand if, you know, what it's allotted for. Um, so, you know, it, even though it's not our business to be in your business, we are concerned that your business yeah. stays strong. Yeah. And we're happy, I mean, to share information. So we have, uh, uh, we've got, two PPE loans, plus we've got the uh, state of Vermont grant. 
and the first PPA loan was forgiven. We, you know, we expect the second one to be forgiven as well. So between, you know, the, the relief from the EFUD payments and, and the, um, and the, and the grants that we've been able to secure, um, you know, that's through half the year where our numbers are actually the, around the same as they were last year. And um, as Jonathan mentioned, you know, what's what the critical, the next big critical part is getting the adults to come back, you know, in, in another month or so that will um, sustain us through the, through the spring season. So, um, you know, we're, um, we're, we're in good shape. You know, we have a little bit of a reserve that we've had for years that we've been hanging on to for, um, you know, if we need to replace a Zamboni or something ma major happens, we have a little bit of cash that we've set aside and we've never, we don't use that for operations. And um, so at this point we're, we're, in, we're fine. Uh, we just, you know, we want to get back to business as normal. What about your, your tank leak that I've seen that's been in the minutes here a couple of times? Are you yeah. getting that under, under control or what's? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say it's under control. I mean, it's leaking, so <clears throat> that's out of our control. But um, just to give you a little bit of background, first of all, I wanted to say we have a guy coming in. As soon as the ground thaws out and it turns to real spring, uh, a guy named Dan Bronner is coming in. I can't remember the company, but uh, Tim, the, our manager, found him. He um, supposedly has experience with this. Uh, so gonna, Hogan, right? Oh, Hogan, right. Jay Hogan yeah. is the company. Uh, in the past, uh, we've had this problem since day one. And the guy who sold it to us, um, John Mead, uh, supposedly had a 15 or 25-year warranty. We're not clear on. We can't remember. There's a sticker on the side of this thing. It fell off real quick and... There was no warranty, apparently. But we've had Brad Oaks from Vermont Refrigeration. He's our um, refrigeration guy. He handles a lot of the rinks, if not most of them in the state. He told us, you know, we've tried all kinds of things. There's gaskets that are leaking. So we replaced those gaskets twice. It didn't do any good. We went inside there, and Charlie Barber went in and ground the inside of it and lined it with ice and water shield. We figured, well, that'll do it. That didn't work. Um, I spoke with a guy named Jerry Marshall from Pearson Engineering. This is back in 2015. Uh, I can't remember. I found his name. I was looking <clears throat> through my emails just to see who, if I could find all the people we've talked to on this. I don't remember how I got in touch with him, but he looked at it. He said he'd make some phone calls. He said he knew John Mead. I mean, we went back and forth on this and then that's what came of it. So, um, I mean, we have never taken this lightly. We're not dismissing it. Um, it's definitely something that we want to deal with, but we can't afford a hundred thousand dollars to replace it. Um, at least not at this time and in these circumstances, but just to set everybody's mind at ease, there's no chemicals in the water that's leaking. We don't add anything to the water. It's just Waterbury tap water, <clears throat> um, which we're paying for. We're not happy about it, but we're paying for it. Um, it's not really a waste. I'm, according to Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no water shortage right now for the, the reservoir is full and you've got a good supply of water. Unfortunately, it's an iceberg there in the winter and a mud puddle in the summer. So we're not happy about it, but if anybody has any suggestions or yeah. ideas, we're open to anything. So I, I might have a suggestion and this is only because I know the history, somewhat of the history of of another hot water um, reservoir. Um, is this tank? Is this this tank? Is it is it just cold water? Just tap water? There's no. It's yeah. not heated or anything like that. What it does is the um, <clears throat> without getting too far into the weeds on this, we circulate refrigerant. And after it comes out of the ice, it's got heat in it. We have to cool it back down. And with one of the ways they send it back under the ice, there's two, there's a heating system underneath to keep the frost from going down. And then what doesn't, if there's still heat in it, which there is, then it goes out to this cooling tower where there's a fan and it just, like, it's like a shower. It just pours water on these pipes and that cools it. So it doesn't run all the time, but when the, the, if the heat is present when it calls for the shower it, it does the shower and 
it just leaks. It just goes right through. And we've tried plugging the holes. Like I said, we replaced the gaskets twice. And it worked for a little bit, but a year later, it's still pouring out of the problem is it, there's this all this expansion and contraction because of the temperature variation that goes on. And it's just it's a really bad design. Um, I wish they had built something that was designed for this, but apparently, and I'm told by this guy, Brad Oaks, our refrigeration guy, he said they all leak. He said ours leaks pretty bad, but. John, is it supposed to, uh, is it supposed to be a closed system where, you know, this showers onto the pipes, cools them down and then gets recaptured? And yes, it's not supposed to be. Yeah, it's not it's, supposed to leak out of there. Right, but, but it's, so it's, if it works right, it's not supposed to use a lot of tap water, then, right? Because right. it's going to recirculate this water until you need to. Correct. I'm not an engineer. And to be honest with you, I mean, a lot of what they explained to me, I have the basics down of how all this stuff works. It's a pretty complicated situation. I mean, you're welcome to come down for show and tell anytime. I mean, anybody who's got any ideas or, or knows somebody who has some, you know. Well, yeah, that, I was, that's what I point I was getting to. Uh, you know Joel Baker, right? Yeah. yeah I know of him. You should uh, maybe talk to him. Uh, I think he built, if I'm correct, I'm pretty sure he built a, a hot water storage tank in his own house out of ICF blocked. Um, you know, that's what kind of rung the bell there when you were talking about this tank leak. And, and uh, if it were ICF blocked, of course, it's a concrete center. Uh, it may endure these temperature changes or, you know, without seeing this tank, I can't give you a better idea but you know it's a shot in the dark but it's uh better than what you got right now and he may be able to fix you up uh, with something of of his concoction that uh might do your might do the trick at a, a lot less cost okay well anything's worth a try mike yeah. the other person i would i would recommend you jonathan is to reach out to is larry westover he has his own plumbing company He's a pretty sharp individual. And, you know, in terms of, you know, any kind of, you know, water kind of issues, he might be someone to read, you know, he might tell you, you know, I don't know anything about this, but at least it's, it's a suggestion yeah. for you. Someone to reach out locally. So if any of you are down at, in the ice center area, you don't have to go in the rink. The cooling tower we're talking about, it's out behind the rink. Uh, you can't miss it. It's up on stilts. It's probably, I don't know, eight, 10 feet up in the air, probably I think eight feet up. And uh, if it's running, you'll, it's a fountain. You can't miss it. So, um, you know. Yeah, anybody, those are good suggestions. We can reach out to them. Yeah. yeah. I'll take a look next time I'm down that way. Okay. 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 Um, any other items to discuss? We've got to keep moving forward. I just wanted to introduce myself to Michael and Jonathan. I'm Danny. I'm the newest select board member. So good to see you. Good to meet you. Yeah. Likewise. Congratulations. All right. Um, Jonathan and Michael, since we have you, anything else before we continue on? Nope. We're good. Thank you for the support. We appreciate it. Thank you for coming to the meeting this evening. Okay. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. night. Um, so it looked like there there wasn't anything for the senior center. There was just nice discussion. So it's just an error. So we'll move on. Um, I believe this is where we move to um, move the consider newspaper of record and alternative. Yeah. So you have to uh, you have to uh, uh, adopt the newspaper of record. Um, the state law still requires many public notices to be actually published in a physical newspaper, uh, even though more and more people aren't reading them and, and all the physical newspapers still have some online presence as well. Um, I would think for this year we can, staff will recommend that the Waterbury Roundabout be the newspaper of record and the Times Zargus be the alternate. Um, once in a while, there is a, a, a need to be able to publish something that's in, a, in more or less a daily paper. The Times Argus is published um, five days a week, not every day, but it's published Tuesday through Saturday. Um, and 
for the times that, you know, if you're going to have a bond vote, for instance, you have to publish it in the newspaper on the same day of the week, three weeks in a row, and it's easier to do that sometimes in a, uh, in a daily. But the Waterbury Roundabout uh, right now gets mailed to every house in Waterbury, from what I understand. No, uh, it's the Waterbury Reader. What's it's that? The Waterbury Reader. Reader, I'm sorry. I keep saying roundabout. The Waterbury Reader um, is mailed to every, uh, every resident in Waterbury. It also has an online presence. So we would recommend the Waterbury Reader for the uh, newspaper record and the uh, Times Argus as the alternate. Right. Anyone want to make that motion or discuss it further? I move to have the Waterbury Reader as our paper of record with uh, the Times Argus as the alternate. Right. Is there a second? I will happily second that. I'm just going to add abstain as they are one of my employers. Okay. All right. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Um, I believe I added a uh, discussion that the email we all received about um, the, I think it's the abandoned house. Um, I was just hoping we could discuss that really quick. Um, and if there's anything we should be doing as a board right now. Talking about Charlie Astley's old place here on River Road, first place on the left. Little River Road, yeah. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, there's not a lot that, that can be done about this right now. Uh, one time in my career as a municipal manager, uh, we actually sought legal advice and the select board um, declared a building of public nuisance and we ordered that it be removed. Uh, that was a building that was where the parking lot is right now between the steel block where the Waterbury Sports is and uh, the Bargain Boutique. There was a building there up until about 1990 and Peter Albert owned it. And uh, there was severe problems with it. Uh, the board um, was able to get uh, make a motion to call it a public nuisance and that allowed him to then uh, evict the tenants from the building and he took the building down. The town didn't do anything. This house is uh, on Little River Road. It's uh, pretty much abandoned. I think there might be somebody living in a camper in the driveway. Um, the, uh, the bank that holds the mortgage on it for whatever reason, even though from what we understand, nobody's making payments on the mortgage every time we put it up for tax sale, which could ultimately result in somebody buying it for taxes or the town uh, deciding to buy it for taxes. The bank, um, every time it's gone to tax sale in the last three or four years has paid the taxes on it. Uh, so we, we don't have the ability to get the title that way. Um, and uh, I think that it's not so easy to just declare it a public nuisance uh, and, and demand that it be torn down. Um, there are a lot of falling down buildings all around Vermont. I mean, there's a farmhouse on Route 100, pretty prominent place that is in no better shape than this place is. And if, you, if you're gonna get in there and try to declare it a public nuisance, you might be opening the Pandora's box. Um, I have forwarded the email that I got today to uh, the zoning administrator. Uh, there may be, uh, through the zoning process, the ability to chase away the person who's maybe living in that camper, uh, but it's, a, it's not an easy thing to do, and it could cost the town a lot of money. So uh, I, have, I have mailed letters to all of the mortgage holder banks, and the, you know, the, they keep 
for whatever reason, the mortgage keeps being moved from different banks. I think it's on the third different bank that I'm aware of now. I have taken pictures of it. I've written letters to the banks and said, you know, this house is burned. Uh, you should send somebody here to at least board it up. Um, nobody's taken any initiative to do anything. So um, that's my report. I'm not sure what more we can do. No, I think that's all I was hoping for is just to hear um, what options we have and, and what we might be doing. Um, go ahead, Mike. I have a bit of experience with the whole condemnation process being, you know, having been in banking. It is very cumbersome and a lot of banks don't want to go forward with any, because they don't want to take the properties back because they're very concerned about their financial liability. They take, you know, you have anything from hazardous waste to all kinds of other issues that can come about if they take possession. So that's why a lot of times, uh, Banks, if anything, will, you know, sell a property by, you know, absolute auction just to try to get rid of it. So they never really take possession of the property themselves. I think we want to walk with a very, you know, you, we want to be very tenuous how we want to be because we could also be have a lot of liability, you know, who knows what there's hazardous waste and materials. It's not like, you know, years ago when, you know, you got the fire department in to do a controlled burn to, you know, get rid of the property down, down to, you know, ashes and stuff, you know, it's just a very difficult process. And I think we really want to think before we, and as was said, you know, this might create a precedent. There are other, you know, properties in disrepair that, you know, you know, we just want to really think about what we're doing. Just with my comments. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Or, or Carla, go ahead. Yeah, I would just add that on paper, the property is privately owned by Frank Sanborn, although abandoned, and that a complaint for foreclosure was filed, I think, like seven years ago, but nothing's become of it. So it's essentially yeah. private property. They never, they, they notified that there, there was a foreclosure action that could take place, but they, to Mike's point, they never uh, initiated it. All right, I don't have anything else. Does anyone have anything else on that? We can- Yeah, I'm just, I'm just wondering if, if, if there was a tragic death or something like that from, let's say a child got into the building and an accident happened, um, Who's at fault, Bill? Is it the bank because they keep covering the butt on the taxes on this thing? I mean, it seems uh, like they're showing they're showing the liability of the property because they're footing the bill every time it goes up for tax sale. Yeah, I'm not a lawyer, Chris. I I I can't really answer that question. Um, what I can tell you is I don't think the town has got any responsibility for it. All right. Chris, it's the deep pocket rule. It's if in the case of a lawsuit, they'll go after every party that they possibly can. You know, usually it's going to be the, the bank. But again, you know, they don't own the own own the property. And, you know, if the property owner doesn't have a lot of assets, you know, they may go after a, a mortgage holder. But, right. you know, and, and, you know, to that point. Mike is exactly right. I mean, it's if something happened there, um, you know, the town has, I say the town has no interest and no liability. It doesn't mean the town can't be sued. If a private property owner, you know, they suffer a loss, there's damages, they can sue whomever they think is responsible. Uh, our insurance company would defend us. And I think, based on what I know, that you know, the judge would say this isn't the town's responsibility. I can't guarantee that, but I think we get into a much deeper problem if we try to do something without having title to this property. Look, so can I ask us maybe a dumb question here? Is it, it does it behoove the town to maybe put a send a letter to the bank? Uh, obviously, the fire chief doesn't have access to the property. Uh, 
is there something that we could do proactively on to, to help ourselves to say to the bank, you know, we're in fear that this property is, you know, could endanger people. We want to make you aware of the fact that our hands are- I can are do that again, Chris. I've already done that. I, I, I've sent that to the, to the banks already. I, I, I've, I've been there, I've taken pictures of it. I took the pictures, I wrote a letter, I sent it to the bank and said, you have the mortgage on this property. The, you know, the, as far as I know, the property owner is incarcerated somewhere. Um, and, you know, they basically thrown their hands up. Uh, so I've, I've reached out to the banks. Uh, I can do that again, but I have tried to, to do just that, to say, hey, you know, if something happens here, you have the mortgage on this, maybe somebody's going to come after you. Maybe you can send somebody out there and board the place up, take the, take the property back. But for whatever reason, nobody wants to touch the place. I didn't know if it switched hands that the new bank didn't get that memo. But that's yeah, not as far as I know. We can look, but sounds like you've done what you needed to do. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? All right, we will move on to manager's items. I don't think there was anything else. Um, discuss board email addresses. Okay, so uh, when Danny was uh, elected last week and we reached out to her, she asked if there was a possibility that we could assign to her a uh, waterburyvt.com email address, which is the town's uh, domain. I have been talking about this with uh, our IT contractor, Bob Butler, for about a year now and have not really pulled the trigger. But since Danny asked about it, it probably makes good sense for all board members, all elected officials in the town and uh, even some of the appointed boards to, um, to have uh, a Waterbury BT address assigned. Um, if that's assigned, then the town server would would capture all the emails that are sent to and from those Waterbury BT addresses. If there's ever a, a public records re request for emails, um, you know, right now, if there was a public records request you guys and women would have to potentially go into your own emails, try to find everything that they're looking for. So uh, I've talked to Bob about this. It's something that can be done. I don't know how quickly. We just had a big, uh, over the weekend, I think I mentioned it to you in my email this afternoon, uh, there was a, a hack into our email system that shut it down over the weekend. So. Um, this is something I think probably makes good sense, and I appreciate Danny bringing it up. Um, and if you want to say something, Danny, certainly go ahead. I think you covered it. It makes um, the request for records really simple. It it keeps you know personal and um, official business separate, and seems very clean. It also increases accessibility for the public. It's just a lot easier if it's um, you know streamlined and. Um, is the same for everyone versus looking for personal emails that folks may or may not check. So um, unless there's objection, I think I'm going to be working with Bob to, to start moving forward on this. Um, he will probably have to contact you as individuals. There's, there's a few things that he's going to need, but uh, it should be a fairly straightforward and simple process. I'm not a a tech person, so I can't tell you exactly how it will be done, but it's it's fairly straightforward and should be pretty easy. How do you check your email from a web browser? Carla? What do you mean? I'm just wondering, like, you know, for me personally, I use Gmail for everything. I just don't know, um, you know, I if we end up in a private server, potentially it means that we would need to have a, a software, yeah. unless there's a way that there's like a, a web email yeah. pocket, yeah. right? So you, it would require the use of Microsoft Outlook. 
Yeah. Just, okay. That's a good question, though. Yeah, we will. Bob will work with you on that. We'll, we'll try to make this as seamless as possible. Uh, he talked to me a little bit about it the other day and explained some of it. And as I said, I, I'm i not a tech geek. I really don't, except for when I'm working, I don't use computers at all. So it kind of goes over my head. I don't pay a lot of attention to it. Um, but uh, he'll, he'll, have a conversation with you, Mark, and we'll try to make it so it's as easy as possible for all of you to use it without a lot of complications. And, uh, you know, it should be at no, uh, no cost to you folks and stuff like that. So uh, we'll have him talk to you and I'm sure you'll understand it better than I did. Like good. That's, um, what Mark raised was my biggest concern. You know, I know, you know, having different email addresses, sometimes, you know, um, I think it's a good idea on some levels, but it, it's going to be the e ease of us being able to access it. I know all of us have our email, our current email addresses posted on the town website and probably other places. And, you know, so I think we're pretty open to that. If Bob's able to get where we're able to access that easily on the road, et cetera, that's going to be the biggest concern. And I think probably every one of us are probably going to have that concern. Yeah, Another think... option is you can you can have that forwarded to your personal email. And I'm sure yep. it sounds like Bob is, I, I don't know. That, um, and, and that's that where, if, if that could happen, that would be great. Yeah, I'm sure yeah, that they can help us with any of those concerns. I think it, or... I think it can be pretty seamless. So uh, so the, it seems like everybody's agreeable and then I'll take the next step and, and you know I think with the select board will be the first group that we move to this new new platform if you will and uh, uh, I'll be speaking with Bob in the next couple of days and hopefully he'll be out to you pretty pretty quickly. Sounds good. Uh, anything else on that? All right, we'll move on. Uh, new board member orientation. Okay, so um, Katie was new last year and uh, I think had one, maybe two meetings in person before COVID struck. And then there was a meeting where a whole bunch of people showed up at the steel room and I kind of got frustrated with you and said, don't ever come back again until this is over. So, um, Danny's the new person on the block, so to speak. Um, in the past, especially, there was a couple of times where we actually had three board members out of five who were brand new. So I did uh, quite a bit of formal orientation uh, at the meeting. Uh, we would take 15 minutes or so at several meetings in a row to just bring up some new information. Um, I don't have anything specific to share tonight. I think that I will try as things come to mind, I'll put them on the agenda and we'll be able to talk about them a little bit. I think, Danny, you said that you were signed up for the VLCT training. Yes, it's on the 24th. Okay, that's fine. And as I, as I sent to you in an email, um, <laughs> I'm not sure how much they will talk about the town manager form of government there. Um, it is um, significantly different than uh, towns like Duxbury that, that are just select board towns. Um, Waterbury has chosen the manager form of government. Uh, the select board appoints a, a professional manager. That's me. And um, the select board has no role in personnel matters. Uh, except for basically setting policies, personnel policies, um, as a role in setting pay uh, through the budget process. But the manager uh, recruits, hires, supervises, disciplines, and if necessary, terminates employees. The select board has no role in the day-to-day 
uh, administration of the town through its employees. Um, that's the manager's responsibility. Um, the manager is also the uh, purchasing agent for the town. Uh, in essence, the manager in a town manager form of government has all the authority vested in the manager that is typically vested in the select board in the other communities. Uh, there are a few exceptions to that. Um, the zoning administrator, for instance, is, is nominated by the planning commission and the select board actually uh, appoints the zoning administrator. The manager does not appoint the zoning administrator. That's one kind of quirk in the, in the law. Um, the manager is um, given the responsibility to prepare a budget for the town and the select board uh, has the authority to approve that budget and to submit it to the voters at uh, annual meeting or a special town meeting if necessary. Once the budget is approved, it's the manager's uh, responsibility and authority to execute the budget. Uh, we talked about the orders already, so um, all, all payables are put on a, a warrant order and the select board gets to review that and has to sign off on that before the treasurer can draw checks on the, on the town's uh, bank account. Um, it's a pretty collaborative process. I've always gotten along very well with uh, the select boards that I've worked with. Um, I don't try to hide anything. There's, uh, you know, every opportunity if the select board feels that there's a, a concern or an issue uh, in a particular department uh, in terms of operations, those things are discussed routinely at select board meetings. Um, obviously, personnel matters are not discussed in open session. Uh, there are occasions where uh, if there's discipline going to happen, which is very rare, fortunately, here, uh, that the select board might have to be involved in, um, in uh, executive session private uh, discussions about those issues. Um, but I just want to state to you directly and to all of you as well, and I think the rest of the four know this, you know, if you have any questions about anything, if there's something that you think is uh, unusual, odd, you just have a question about how, how a particular uh, program runs or, you know, uh, what the town is responsible for, certainly, you know, I encourage you to reach out to me anytime. Uh, if there are any issues that you want on the agenda. This is a select board meeting. Uh, much of the agenda is put together by uh, Carla and, and me, but select board members have, uh, have the ability as individuals to just say, I want to talk about X, Y, and Z issue. Just let us know. We'll put that on the, on the agenda. And uh, uh, I guess that's it for right now. And we usually ask for agenda items by noon on Friday. Thank you. Okay. Any of the other board members have anything to add? No. Welcome to the board. Welcome. It's a learning process. You'll have fun. Yeah, I just wanted to to say that, you know, Bill, you and Carla and the rest of the staff have always been real accommodating when it comes to assisting any of the board members with any of their questions and concerns. One of the most important things came up a little bit in an email, maybe you were already on, but we have to be very careful outside of the meeting how we gather to discuss anything. You really can't gather three, if three of us are gonna attend a public meeting, it really has to be warned. So. If there's a hot topic and we think more than two board members are going to show up, we should really um, warn it. Um, and then in emails, you shouldn't. We shouldn't be trying to email each other as a group outside of meetings, um, and even outside of meetings, discussing three three of us standing in a group, um, I believe, breaks open meeting law. So um, just be aware of that. Um, Certainly could. Could. 
Yeah. I mean, you know, if you're standing on the street watching the Independence Day parade and you're together, that's probably okay, but you have to make sure that you don't talk about business while you're, while you're there on the street. But the emails is important. It's kind of um, counterintuitive and antithetical to how we all operate now. And, you know, you saw today probably I did send an email out to, to Mike who had a question about, you know, election of officers tonight. Uh, you really should not send emails to the five select board members uh, because once you do that, you're, you're really conducting a meeting. So it's, um, it's not how we operate most of the time today. It takes a little bit of discipline, but I would uh, ask you all to refrain from doing that. And when you do it, you shouldn't copy me on it because if you do, I'm going to send an email that says you're breaking all the meeting lot. Don't do this. So, so when we have, oh, I'm sorry, when we have emails from the public, like we are, you know, do to all of us, what's the best protocol? Um, would it be like if, if there is something to discuss to make sure that you respond privately just to that person and not reply all, or is that still not? Okay, should we come to you? Yeah, you should definitely not reply to all if, mm -hmm. if there are more than, uh, if there are three or more select board right. members on that email. So my advice to you, if, if, someone, if someone emails you, you know, if Dana emails you and says, hey, I've got an issue about speeding on, on Stowe Street, <laughs> and he sends it to all five board members, there's nothing that prohibits him from sending a, an email out to everyone um but what you should do is to just say respond to him say thank you dana i got your email i'm going to put this on the agenda for you know the next meeting and we'll talk about it then that's really how you should handle that if there's something that somebody emails to you and you believe that it's something important that the town should address uh, you should respond to that person and also include me on your response or email me independently or call me and say, you know, Dana's brought up this issue. There's a safety concern. Uh, you know, there's a sign that, you know, is missing or what have you. You know, communicate those things to me and we'll try to take care of that. I mean, we, I try when I interact with people as much as possible, not that I'm trying to cut the select board out of uh, anybody's uh, correspondence because you are their elected officials and I'm, I'm not an elected official, I'm appointed, I work for the board. Uh, uh, but you know, I do try to encourage people, if you have an issue, you should contact me directly, contact the manager's office, contact the clerk's office. We'll try to address it because the select board, no one select board member has any authority uh, you know, Mark is the chairperson, but he's the chair of the select board to just run the meetings. Uh, no one select board member can direct a, an employee to do anything. So those types of things you should let me know about and I'll address them. And then if we have to talk about them at a meeting, we, we will do that. All right, anything else or we can move on? All right, uh, investment portfolio. Okay, uh, Carla, can you let me share my screens, please? I think you should be able to. Okay. Did you try? I did. Yeah, there you go. So I emailed this out to you all this afternoon. Uh, it won't take long to go through this. Um, and I apologize that I wasn't able to get it out last week. I had worked on this on Friday morning. And as I told you, the uh, email server was, uh, was infiltrated by a bot uh, robot and we had to take the email down and it didn't come back into service until late yesterday. And I didn't, I didn't work yesterday. So I sent it out today. Um, Danny, for your information, and you may know this if you read the town report, but um, the town has uh, 
we have one checking account and we operate what we refer to as fund accounting. I don't know how, how familiar you are with uh, GASB accounting standards or accounting in general, but uh, we, we account for our spending and for our revenues through a variety of funds. All of the money really is held in one checking account and uh, the general fund is the main fund. I, I did not, I don't have up here a, uh, a, a financial reports or balance sheets for all the funds. I will send those to you at some point here in the next uh, couple of weeks, just so you can familiarize yourself with it. Um, and the spending that happens in the highway fund or the library fund or the cemetery fund, all the bills are paid out of the general fund, but each of those funds uh, has a, a separate income and expense statement and a separate balance sheet. We have four funds that we actually have investments in. Uh, and the biggest one of those funds is the one that's up here on the screen now. It's the Tax Stabilization Fund. The Tax Stabilization Fund was established in around 1997. Uh, Waterbury Elementary School and Duxbury Elementary School at the time, the two town school districts formed uh, what was referred to then as U45. Uh, we were already in the Howard Union, um, but uh, the Howard Union High School was for our students from um, seventh grade through 12th grade at the time. When U45 was established in the mid 90s, that's when Crossett Brook Middle School was built and Watery and Duxbury uh, began educating their pre-K through eighth grade uh, at both what's now uh, Thatcher Brook Primary School and Crossett Brook uh, Middle School. When that happened, the old elementary school in Duxbury closed and uh, pre-K to four was, uh, those students were sent to Thatcher Brook here in Waterbury. And then uh, fifth grade through eight was sent to Across the brook in, in um, Duxbury. And the middle school was built new in the, in the mid to late 90s. Uh, and at the time, I suggested to the select board and to the school board that, well, Duxbury is going to be using Waterbury Elementary School to send their K to pre K to fourth graders. Uh, we're all building the Cross the Brook School together but Duxbury should buy into the Waterbury Elementary School. And uh, that was agreed to. And uh, Duxbury ended up paying Waterbury uh, about $635,000 to buy into the uh, Waterbury Elementary School at the time. So that money came to the school district at first and it was going to be used to benefit Watery taxpayers in the school district. And after a year or two, I said, well, if the school board has control of that money and it's gonna be used to help Watery students, how can that be done if Watery and Duxbury students are being, done, are being educated together? It would seem that it would be best if that money was uh, owned by the town of Waterbury and under the control of a select board. So around 1990, we had a town meeting and the town transferred the responsibility for this tax stabilization fund from the Waterbury School Board to the Waterbury Select Board. And uh, what we've done with that money since 1997 it was 644,000 that was uh, that Duxbury paid to Waterbury, not 635. So that 644 was invested. And uh, <laughs> if you look, Danny, when you have time at page 45, 41 on the town report, um, you'll see the history there. So we have uh, grown that fund to over a million dollars now. 
And uh, in the 24 years since we've had that fund, uh, we have used about $680,000 to uh, send to the general fund of the town to help uh, stabilize the tax rate. So this money is uh, held in cash and investments. You can see there that at the end of February, there were $415,296 worth of money in investments. Um, actually, uh, 20,705 of that 415 is now in a money market and 394,592 is in uh, securities. And you can see there under my handwritten portfolio, we have some good fixed investments here that we bought a number of years ago. Uh, we have uh, three corporate bonds, two of them are paying over 7% and one of them is paying 6.45%. Uh, you can't get anywhere close to that on corporate bonds today. We have an annuity that was purchased in, I think, 2012, and it runs through 2025 or something like that. That's at 6%. There's $208,000 in that now. And then, as I said, the money market and the mutual funds at the end of February were worth about $161,000. So every so often... I share this information with the select board. Uh, we do have an investment policy. I will get that out to you. It might be on the website, but we do have an investment policy that guides me as I uh, manage this money along with Carla. Um, as you can see here in February, at the end of February, because the stock market was then at close to an all time high, it has continued to go up since then, but um, I, I did uh, sell, as I put in my email today, um, out of the a uh, little bit of more than a million dollars that we actually had in, in uh, equity securities in these four funds. We sold about 103,000, a little bit more than 10%, and $20,000 of, of this 415 was sold on February 25th, and it's just in a money market fund now, and uh, we'll leave it there for the time being. And then, you know, if the market has a correction and drops, we might put some of that back in. Um, the next fund is the CC Fisher Fund. This is a much more modest fund. It's uh, $32,445. This is a fund that was actually originally um, a private fund of the Waterbury Village Fire Department. C.C. <clears throat> uh, Fisher was uh, a chief in the Village Fire Department back uh, probably in the 70s. It was before my time here. Um, this fund is named for him. Um, in the late 1990s, the village fire department merged officially with the town fire department, and this money was, uh, at that time, just before the merger, the village fire department asked the town if it would manage the money for them. Um, and then when the village fire department and the town fire department merged, this became a town fund. Um, this money is, when it's used, it's it's usually used uh, from an off budget perspective to provide some training for firefighters. We've actually sent a few of the firefighters to a uh, um, firefighting school. Hasn't happened in a while. So I share this information with the fire chief every so often. <laughs> but it's a fund that this money has to be used for the benefit of the fire department. It can't be used for anything other than that. Um, but we haven't used any of it for quite some time now. <clears throat> this is the cemetery fund. Uh, the Waterbury cemeteries are governed by elected officials. They are town elected officials. There are five cemetery commissioners. Um, this money, the genesis of this money was from two cemetery associations. Uh, until about 10 years ago, uh, the Waterbury Cemetery Commission did almost nothing except sell graves. Uh, 
There were two cemetery associations, uh, one in Waterbury Center that basically took care of the cemetery that's on Maple Street, and then the Hope Cemetery Association that uh, uh, took care of the cemetery here down in the village. Um, unfortunately, over time, and because volunteerism is diminishing for a variety of reasons, uh, the majority of the members of these cemetery associations are actually under the ground now in the cemeteries. Uh, and, and the older um, folks who were still dealing with these cemeteries came to the cemetery commissioners, commissioners and said, you know, we really don't have the, the capability any longer to maintain these cemeteries. Uh, the town's gonna have to do it. So uh, the cemetery commissioners now have a pretty hefty budget. It's about a $80,000 budget on an annual basis. And, uh, you know, the, the town is actually taking care of mowing the grass and planting trees and the like in these cemeteries. But when the associations disbanded, while they were under no obligation to do so, they turned over their money to the town and they turned over uh, probably in the vicinity of uh, maybe $400,000 between the two funds. They had that money just in cash for the most part. Uh, the town has taken that money. Uh, this money is under the control of the cemetery commissioners, not the select board, but um, it, you can see I did the same thing here. Uh, we sold off about $70,000 of these equities uh, at the end of February. Um, and you know this this fund has grown nicely over the over the ten years that we've had it. Um, so uh, if you have questions about that, you can ask me about it. There is a budget in the town report for the cemeteries, um, and uh, the town the town does budget has budgeted in the past fifteen thousand dollars a year to transfer into this cemetery fund from the taxes of the general fund. Um, we budgeted that $15,000 last year, uh, but because of COVID, uh, we pulled the plug on a whole bunch of projects, including some uh, fairly expensive cemetery projects. So last year, the town did not send that $15,000 to the cemetery fund. And this year, because we we're trying to keep the uh, the tax rate at 53 cents for this year, we trans where we budgeted to transfer only $5,000 from the general fund to the cemetery fund. So um, I can answer more questions about that in the future if you want, Danny, but this is mainly under the uh, purview of the elected cemetery commissioners. <clears throat> the last fund is a veterans monument fund. Um, again, the VFW. Uh, veterans of Foreign War uh, had a small fund of about um, fifty or sixty thousand dollars that they had accumulated over time. They had that money set aside for, um, uh, you know, just general use. The VFW um, was losing membership, and they didn't have uh, the the membership that they wanted to continue. Uh, to, to have an active post. They, they merged with the American Legion, but before they merged with the American Legion, the VFW uh, post members came to, the, to me and then ultimately to the select board and said that they would like to donate their money to the town to be held in trust, to be used to maintain and clean and repair the veterans monuments that are around the community. So that would include the uh, Civil, War, Civil War monument that's at the uh, Thatcher Brook Primary School and the monuments that are at Rusty Parker Park. Uh, we use this to, uh, if there's a new name that has to be engraved on the monument, if uh, we've had some, unfortunately, some vandalism to the monuments that we've had to repair them, uh, we clean the monuments with them. And again, uh, this money was all in cash when we took it over. We've invested it uh, mainly in mutual funds uh, and we did sell off some of those just to 
take some profits, if you will, <clears throat> to guard against a, a big decline in the, in the stock market. So that's what this fund is for. So with that, uh, unless you have any specific questions, Danny or the board members, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Um, as far as budget reporting, Danny, typically I try to do a, uh, uh, a budget update and a review of the financial statements with the board on a quarterly basis. So the first quarter is about to end at the end of March. So probably the second meeting in April, we'll have a budget report and uh, report on the financial statements. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask me at any time. I spend a lot of time on the financial, uh, you know, it's, it's a big part of my job is to, you know, manage the money and the budget of the town. So if there's some question that you have, you can certainly ask me at any point. If you want information on the agenda, you can ask, but pretty typically, we review it in April, in July, and September or October, and then we get into the budget process um, at the end of the year. Okay. <clears throat> Good. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Any questions? Go ahead, Chris. Just a quick question, Bill. Did you? Uh... The monies that you took from each fund was it done based on a, just a flat percentage on each? each yeah, basically, uh, basically. I mean, it's it's a little bit of a variable, but for the most part, you know, about ten percent from every fund. That's all I got. Okay, Thanks. and you know, if if the market continues to go up, I might I might take a little bit more off the table. Uh, again and then you know if it drops down then reinvest at that point um at the next meeting we're going to talk a little bit about the refunding of the uh of the five-year note the 1.3 million dollar note that we took at the end of december and we reviewed that uh, pretty heavily in the budget process i've been in contact with uh our bond council in the last uh, week or so and uh, he just got back to me today. It was, I haven't had a chance to digest it. So it's not on tonight's agenda, but probably when we review that, um, it might be the first meeting in April that I bring that to you. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll report on what's happening, Chris. But at the very least, you know, we may, we may start to reinvest, you know, kind of dollar cost averaging, you know, Five or ten thousand dollars a month, as opposed to dump it all in. I mean, if the market goes down twenty percent, then we probably, you know, push a lot of it back in there. But uh, at some point, we'll we'll get it back uh, towards being fully invested. It's pretty tough to uh, predict this over inflated market right now. I tell you, you don't know whether to, you know. It's pretty crazy. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway. Okay. Any other comments, questions? All right. Uh, Arbor Day tree planting grant, which was emailed from Bill. Right. Yeah. I don't need to share the screen. I sent you uh, the email. Um, Steve Lott's speech came to me last week. There is a we, we try to incorporate all of our grant requests for the year into our budget, but uh, occasionally there are programs that come to our attention outside of the budget cycle. Steve came to me with this one just last week. Um, there's an opportunity to apply for a thousand dollar grant from the Department of uh, Forest Parks and Recreation. This grant has no match to it, so it really doesn't have any budget implications. And it's a tree planting grant. Uh, if the grant is awarded, they're going to try to plant <clears throat> some two trees at the at the Hope Davy Park in Waterbury Center um, in the vicinity of the uh, picnic shelter. Uh, if you look at those maples that were planted there uh, are around that parking lot, they're pretty stressed 
and we think that the groundwater table is too high there for that particular species. So uh, they'd be looking to plant something that can tolerate having its feet wet a little bit better than those maples can. So our recommendation is to authorize the submission of this grant application and authorize me to uh, to uh, sign it on behalf of the county. I move to approve the submission of the Arbor Day tree planting grant in the amount of $1,000 being offered by the Vermont Department of Forest, Parks and Recreation and authorize the municipal manager to sign the application for the town. Okay, is there a second? Uh, Chris, you are muted, but I think you were second. Yeah, I seconded it. Oh, all right, um, made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Great, uh, moving on to discuss the zoning appeal, Grayson Anderson, possible executive session. So there's no need for executive session here. This is the issue I think Glenn Anderson was asking about. And uh, I would encourage the board to simply listen to me. If you have questions and I can answer them, I will. Um, and I would ask Glenn, uh, you know, he should re really refrain from commenting. This is just really to bring the board up to speed. And then uh, the recommendation is to have me make a motion to uh, authorize uh, Stitzel Page and Flesher to put a, an appearance in for the town. So there's a, uh, subdivision up on uh, Sweet Farm Road on the same side of the road that the Hunger Mountain Trailhead parking lot is in. Uh, it abuts uh, Lane Anderson's property and a person by the name of Grayson has uh, applied for and received a permit from the BRB um, <clears throat> to develop that subdivision. And uh, Mr. Anderson has appealed the decision to Superior Court. So in essence, uh, Mr. Anderson is appealing the DRB's decision to issue a permit to Grayson. Now, the way that uh, appeals are heard by the Vermont Superior Court uh, in a town such as Waterbury uh, these appeals are heard de novo by the judge, which means uh, it's a, a new hearing completely. So Waterbury is not an on-the-record town. So the decision that the DRB made and all of the testimony that was presented by the DR to the DRB and all of the documents that were presented to the DRB, uh, if, it, if this were done in an on-the-record town, the, the appeal would be on um, the technical issues and the judge would be using the testimony and the documents that were submitted to help make a determination whether the permit should be upheld or not. Waterbury is not an on the record town. So in essence, the, um, the judge will be hearing this application from the uh, applicant, Grayson, on the record, de novo, uh, and the judge will be acting as the DRB. So there'll be a essentially a new DRB hearing, except instead of before the DRB, it will be before a judge. And um, in cases like this, while the town needs to file an appearance because it is our DRB's permit that is being appealed, uh, pretty typically, the town will have a very minor role in this uh, appeal process. The town's lawyer will essentially be there to try to inform the judge about what the bylaw means and how it should be interpreted. But our attorney in general in these cases will not be advocating necessarily that the DRB's ruling be upheld, 
he'll just be there to inform the judge about what the bylaw means and how it informs the town plan. Uh, the, the applicant, Grayson in this case, really has the burden of defending the permit that the CRB has issued. And the appellant, Mr. Anderson in this case, bears the burden of explaining to the judge why the permit should not be issued. So that's really all I want to say today about this process so that the board understands that we have an issue, we have a permit that the DRB has issued that's under appeal, but it's really at this stage of the game going to go before the judge, but it's going to be the applicant and the appellant that are before the judge and the judge will ultimately make that decision. So with that, I would recommend that the select board, um, some select board member make the motion that I sent to you earlier today to allow Stitzel, Page, and Fletcher to file an appearance on behalf of the town and we'll go from there. So the motion should be made first and then if you have questions, you, we can talk about it. I move to approve representation of the town and filing of an entry of appearance by Stitzel, Page, and Fletcher Professional Corporation in the Grayson Subdivision Permit Appeal before the Environmental Division of Vermont Superior Court. Is there a second? I'll second it. Any further discussion? In, can somebody tell me when that subdivision was approved? We don't have that in. Me. It wasn't very long ago. The, the, the subdivision was approved and then Grayson um, missed the recording deadline to file a flat and stuff like that. So essentially the permit was voided. They came back, uh, presented the same information and got the same approval from the DRB. So my guess it's within the last uh, month or so because obviously the appellant has a certain number of days after the permit is issued. So it's a, it's a recent issuance of a permit that was issued prior, um, but it's being appealed and uh, that's where we are right now. Yeah, the reason I asked is because I was asked to look at some of the infrastructure work on that project a year ago. And uh, so that's, I kind of wondered if there was a statute of limitations on that, but you just gave me the reasons why it, it uh, right. came back to play. So I answered yeah. my question, thanks. Yeah. Okay, well, we have a motion that's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? <laughs> favor, please say aye. 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 Mark, I, I didn't uh, add it to the agenda, um, but it is a zoning appeal. Can I just update the board on what's going on with regard to the um, the uh, Jason Wolf, uh, Aaron Flint property on Stowe Street, which is before the court now under appeal? That's the issue we had the uh, discussion about the interim bylaws on. Can I just bring you up to speed on that? Yeah, I know. I know um, you mentioned. Um, limiting discussion on the last topic, but I was wondering if we could just understand what exactly the basis of the appeal is, or? I, I, I don't know um, what the basis of the appeal is right now. I have not, you know, the, uh, what I've just seen from the court is just a very brief, you know, this matter is under appeal. Um, after the after the uh, attorney um, files his appearance, then I'll have access to more information. So I don't have it right now, man. Thank you. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, so you wanted to do the Stowe Street? Yeah. So just just very quickly, um, <clears throat> you remember when we had the meeting a couple weeks ago and discussed the interim bylaws that Steve had uh, drafted with some input from the planning commission. We had a pretty uh, 
difficult meeting that night with some of the planning commission members. It was a little contentious and the select board decided <clears throat> not to adopt those interim bylaws, uh, asked the planning commission if they could uh, make some recommendations by May 1st. And as you knew from that meeting, uh, the, uh, the DRBs, the DRB upheld the zoning administrator's decision uh, that indicated that particular use that uh, the property owners, uh, Flint and Wolf, wanted to proceed with, Perry Hill Partners, uh, was not permitted in the district. So uh, Perry Hill Partners has appealed that case to court. Uh, we have filed an appearance on that. Um, I heard from our attorney last week. So the judge, we have had a, um, a uh, status uh, meeting on that case. Uh, that was a week or so ago. The judge has directed mediation as a first step to try to resolve this issue. The parties have to choose a mediator by April 16th. And I'm working with the attorney now on uh, making some recommendations to the select board, which we'll probably talk about at your April 5th meeting. And then the mediation has been ordered by May 21st. So pick a mediator by April 16th and start mediation by May 21st. Um, in the interim, uh, the Planning Commission at your request has uh, met twice already this month and they have another meeting in March. They are working uh, right now, um, the majority of them anyway, towards um, providing some input to those interim bylaws that uh, we looked at, at at that hearing a couple of weeks ago. Our hope is that by their, uh, by the end of this month, that they will transmit to the select board um, updated interim bylaws. The ones that Steve wrote will basically be the, the spine and the skeleton, if you will, of, of the interim bylaws that they will be presenting. Uh, the, the Planning Commission is trying to put a little bit more flesh on the bone, so to speak. Uh, some of the issues that the Planning Commission has mentioned that were a, um, you know, that, that they were incomplete, uh, lot size, uh, square footage and the like, they're working towards getting that done. I have talked to our attorney in light of this order to mediate from the judge. And uh, the hope is that the planning commission will transmit to the select board uh, new interim bylaws uh, that you can maybe have for your April 5th meeting. And at that meeting, if we have them in place, uh, the select board can warn a public hearing for 15 days later to have another hearing on the interim bylaws. Our attorney still believes that the better way to resolve this is through interim bylaws, just as the select board had indicated at the last meeting that you would prefer to do this not as spot zoning. Uh, so the hope is that the planning commission will get something to us so that at your April 5th meeting uh, and the second meeting in April at the very latest, that you'd be able to warn a public hearing on interim bylaws and get that public hearing to be held before the mediation has to start around May 20th. And if that happens, then you know we might be able to actually avoid the mediation and avoid uh, you know going going to court. So I haven't said anything now tonight uh, with that. It's just process. It's nothing that has to be discussed in executive session, but that's where we are right now. And uh, staff still believes that resolving this uh, particular case on Stowe Street through interim bylaws is better than resolving it at court 
even if it's through mediation, because court or mediation is only going to deal with that property and no other properties in the district. And the interim bylaws we discussed last time will be uh, more broadly applicable to all of the properties in the district as the planning commission decides. So anyway, that's that. Questions, comments, concerns? Well, I'm curious. Um, I know communication was one of the struggles through this whole process. I'm curious if you have an indication from the planning commission that they do feel prepared to present something in April um, and how they would communicate with that, that with us. Yeah, they, they're working on that now, uh, Danny. They, they uh, scheduled three meetings in March as opposed to their normal two. Um, the, after, after our meeting, um, there was some hope on my part, and I think Ken Bellavo, the chairperson of the Planning Commission, shared it, was that um, maybe that they could, Ken wanted to try to present permanent bylaws to the select board, um, and he wanted to try to get that done by May 1st. That was the deadline that was kind of self-imposed at that meeting when I asked, do you think it's fine? I might have something by May 1st. Ken, the chairperson, was really hoping that uh, permanent bylaws could be transmitted to the select board by that point. And I thought that if those permanent bylaws were transmitted to the select board, it still takes about 90 days from the time the select board gets the permanent bylaws from the planning commission to get them adopted. So I was hoping that the, the select board could take those permanent bylaws and then warn them as interim bylaws that could be adopted in a much shorter period of time within a 15 day time period. But in talking to the attorney, our attorney, he advised that the process of going through um, permanent bylaws and then having the select board warn those as interim is really not something that he would recommend uh, because of the planning commission's process and the public hearings they have to go through. So um, the planning commission, I hope, has shifted gears and, and they're trying to inform uh, and make comments on the last interim bylaws. Now, uh, when I talked with Steve Lotspeech, the community planner last week, he was pretty confident when we were, he was on the call with me with the attorney. He was pretty confident that the planning commission would have something to transmit to the select board by early April. And those can be discussed, I hope at the April 5th meeting, they can be reviewed, but then the select board would have to actually warn the public hearing for later in April. So that's <laughs> where I hope it goes, Danny. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what they, what they come up with. But from what I've heard there, they're striving their level best to get that done. Katie and I attended the last planning commission meeting. Um, I think that was kind of the consensus, at least that I conveyed to them, because they were at one point wanting select board's input. And I said that, you know, to go through the motions of interim and then turn around and make substantial changes for permanent didn't seem to make sense that they were close enough now to what may be considered permanent to, to save, I won't say save the effort, but try to hit that mark as close as possible so that there were little or no changes. You know, once the interims, if they use that set of laws as an interim, there wouldn't be much any changes after that to make them permanent. So, um, yeah, I, I think I think you're right, Bill. I think they're. I think we're gonna we're gonna get it. Okay, that's all I have for information. There's no action necessary. Okay, thanks for the update. Um, does anyone? have anything else to discuss tonight or we can end the meeting and I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. 
Is there a second? Or. <laughs> all right. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Good to see you again, like always. Good night, everyone. Stay safe. Have a nice, sunny, warm weekend. <laughs>